Hi kiddos, it's Mrs. Demfeld, and today we're going to be reading three chapters in Hello Universe. We're going to start on chapter 24. That starts on page 172. Valencia. I've never been to a psychic house before, but I guess I expected something different. Like a big glowing sign that said, palm ringing or fortunes here. But instead, the address led me straight to a regular house. I'm not sure what to think of this. Is this a good sign or a bad sign? Does this mean Kiori is or is not a crazy person? There is only one way to find out. I walk up and ring the doorbell. I can tell that it works by the way it vibrates under my fingertips. You'd be surprised how many people have broken doorbells. I stare at the door with my heart beating, but I don't have to wait long before it opens and a little girl is standing there. She looks like she's in first grade or something. She has a pink jump rope slung over her shoulder. She's a lot younger than I thought, but at least she's not a serial killer. No wonder I couldn't find her online anywhere. She's probably too young to even use the computer. Password, she says. Venus rises in the West. The girl eyes my hearing aids. What are those? Hearing aids, I say. I wait for her reaction. Sometimes people get scared when they find out you can't hear. They don't want to talk to you, or they don't know where to look. Their eyes dart all around like they're searching for an invisible portal to take them somewhere else. But this just girl said, but this girl just says, you talk funny. I say, I know, it's because I'm deaf. Oh, she says, and opens the door wide. The house is very neat and clean, and it smells like incense. Curls of smoke drift out of the room down the hall. This is where the girl leads me. Dear St. Renee, if there's a crazy psycho, psycho killer in that smoky room, please protect me. Amen. Turns out there's no crazy psycho killer, just another girl, about my age. I know that right away that I know right away this is Kiori. She's standing in front of a huge star chart with her hands on her hips. She turns when I walk in. Her face looks distracted. Her eyebrows are doing this slight wrinkle in the middle, which is what happens when you are worried. You know how I said I can tell a lot about a person by their eyes? Well, Eyebrows have even more to say. Are you just Renee, she asks. At first I'm confused, but then I remember I gave her a fake, a fake just in case name. Yes, the little girl walks up to her sister, so they're both facing me. She has hearing aids and she talks funny, the little girl says. I tell them about how the how-tos and expect them to look nervous or uncomfortable, but neither of them does. Kiori seems to have other things on her mind. I'm Kiori, she says. I apologize for being a little distracted. I have a client who was supposed to be here two hours ago, and I'm worried. You didn't see him, did you? What's he look like? He's Small, kind of scrawny, with brown skin and dark hair, Kiori says. She looks right at me and talks slowly, just like I asked. He looks scared all the time. He carries a purple backpack. He's 11. His name is Virgil, the little girl adds. My name is Jen. Small, scrawny, with dark hair, Jen and Kiori nod. I know I didn't see any boy like that this morning, but something about that description feels familiar. And a purple backpack, Jen says. And look scared all the time. I feel like I know this person. The name Virgil doesn't mean anything to me, but that's because it's hard for me to remember names. I'm much better with faces. I didn't see anyone on my way to Curie's, though, that's for sure. I haven't seen him, I say. She frowns. I'm sure he'll turn up. After a moment, she forces a smile and says, let's talk about your dreams. Are they good or bad? If they were good, I wouldn't be here, I said. 
Excellent point, Curie says. She points to the circle rug and tells me to sit down. I do. Now, she says, sitting across from me next to Jen, let us begin. I can't help but notice that her worried look hasn't disappeared, not completely. Chapter 25, page 178. The girl who didn't know her destiny. Virgil covered his ears, pressed his palms against them until it hurt. His heartbeat moved from his chest to his head, and yet the rustling was still there. Louder somehow, the sound of ruffled feathers managed to soar above everything, and that the thump, the thump, the thump of his heart and the huff, huff, huff through his nostrils, but he refused to open his eyes. He couldn't anyway, because they were glued shut. His eyeballs ached, the, ap the apples of his cheeks too, his whole face had been balled into a knot and tightened. No, he couldn't look. He wouldn't. The wings moved again. Were they closer? They felt closer. Was that a feather on his cheek? Or he flinched in the same way he did when he, his teachers called on him, though he hadn't raised his hand. Can you tell us the answer, Virgil? They'd ask, looking right at him. She shook his head. He shook his head. No, no, no. What is the solution? Does anyone know, Virgil? One time in Mrs. Murray's class, he had said in a low, low voice exactly what he was thinking. But I didn't raise my hand. Sometimes life calls on you even when you don't raise your hand, she said. The wings were bigger now, he could tell. They were spreading, tips touching opposite sides of the well, talk, taking up all the space that he and Gulliver couldn't manage to fill. <sighs> when would he feel the talons? Open your eyes, a voice said. That's the solution. The voice wasn't his. It was coming from inside the well, through his hands and his heart and failed breaths. It was embodied as if, it, as if from beyond. It was a girl's voice, one he'd never heard before. Virgil opened his mouth, dry and parched grass, like parched grass, to say, who said that? But he wasn't sure he'd actually said anything until she replied. Me. The voice breezed through the well like a stream drifting up, drifting from a cup of hot chocolate. Virgil pushed himself back against the wall as far as he could. I don't want to open my eyes, he said. This time he was sure he spoke in aloud. The more scared you are, the bigger fog gets, the girl said. Besides, he's not as bad as you think. Most things aren't. She sounded so calm that Virgil almost believed her. She, she reminded him of Lola, even though she was just a girl. But where'd she come from? He, has, he wasn't certain of much, especially not now, but he knew there hadn't been a girl in the well when he climbed down. I don't believe in ghosts, he said, even though that wasn't true at all. Me neither, the girl replied. He realized how his breath had calmed breathing had calmed and he couldn't hear Fa anymore, but he still didn't want to open his eyes. What if Fa was staring back at him, widening in his enormous beak? He won't be, said the girl. Trust me. How did you know how does she know what I'm thinking? I hear by seeing, she replied. Virgil unscrewed his face, and his hands were making his ears sweat. He didn't he didn't dare uncover them. He opened his eyes instead, slowly, slowly. Darkness, more darkness, but no pointed beak, no feathers, no talons, no fa. The well had just been, just what, the well was just as it had been. His heartbeat slowed, still racing and ready for takeoff, but no longer desperate to crash through his chest. See, the girl said proudly. He moved his hands to his sides, slowly, slowly, and darted his eyes around the dark. Where are you, he asked. It came out as a whisper. I'm all around, can't you tell? Yes, he could tell. Her voice came from everywhere, like the well itself was speaking. 
Wells can't talk, said Virgil. He placed his palm on one of the stones without moving any other part of his body. It felt like the well was breathing. I can see that you're afraid, Benini, but you needn't be. How can, how, how can you see? I see by listening. My name isn't Be Beani. It is to me, the girl said. Who are you? Ruby San Salvador. The name sounded vaguely familiar. The girl who didn't know her destiny, she explained. Remember? Yes, he remembered from Lola's story. What are you doing here? Virgil's voice was small. Ba has, had disappeared, for now. Fulfilling my destiny, said Ruby. Your destiny is to live in a well? No, my destiny is to help people in trouble. Virgil clutched his backpack. Can you move the cover and help me up the ladder? Of course not, you need arms to move those things. Oh, said Virgil. Silence filled the well. Gulliver squeaked. I guess it's hopeless, whispered Virgil. Oh, Beani, Ruby replied, nothing is ever hopeless. That was chapter 25. We're gonna read one more. Chapter 26, page 185. Interpretation of a dream. It was true that Kiori had studied dreams. Well, on the internet at least. She believed the unconscious was a powerful force, quite powerful indeed, and sometimes the brain needed dreams to get rid of all the things that people made, that, pe that made people afraid or anxious. To Kiori, the solution was clear. Overcome your fears and your nightmares will go away. After hearing the details of, of just Renee's nightmare, she knew exactly what the problem was. It was clear as anything. She was sure just Renee was looking at her. She said, you're afraid of girls in blue dresses. Renee tilted her head skeptically, then shook it. They were sitting on, the, on a zodiac sign, the usual placement, Kiori and Jen on one side and the client on the other. I don't think that's it, offered Jen. Kiori turned towards her sister. Excuse me, but you're not the expert here. And besides, how do you know my interpretation isn't accurate? Jen shrugged. Just seemed too, I don't know, too obvious. Sometimes the simpler the answer is the real answer. Sometimes the simple answer is the real answer, Kiori said. She turned back to Renee, who looked unconvinced. But I'll concentrate further, just in case I may be wrong. She stressed the may part. She closed her eyes and pictured Renee standing in a field all in that field all by herself. You're scared, said Curie. You're afraid of being alone. When she opened her eyes, Renee's face nodded like she'd just eaten something sour. I'm not scared, she said, like it was a bitter word she needed to spit out. I like being alone. It's easier that way. Kiori and Jen <coughs> exchanged looks. Kiori wasn't used to being challenged by her clients. Then again, her only client was Virgil. Well, said Kiori, she spoke carefully, pausing here and there to make sure Renee was getting all the, her important information. I could be wrong, but it seems to me that you feel alone, or maybe you're afraid of feeling alone. That's why you get scared when you look around and everyone's gone, because it's like you live in a bubble. Everyone looks at you like you're invisible, and then one day you are invisible. That would be scary to anyone. Jen nodded with vigor. Just Renee made a face that was a cross between a frown and a scowl. I like being alone, she insisted and crossed her arms. Oh. Kiori said, alone is good. It is less trouble. Maybe I'm way off, probably because I'm worried about Virgil. I can't seem to concentrate. Jen nodded again. 
It's true, she said. She stared at those lines for a really long time before you got here. She pointed to the star chart. Renee glanced at the chart and then looked back at the sisters. Curie wanted to explain that they weren't merely lines, but she figured it was best to leave well enough alone, as her father liked to say. Well, Renee said. She uncrossed her arms. I can help you look for him if you want. Kiori eyed her new client curiously. Renee was stubborn, but a quick frizzling temp with a quick frizzling temper. Interesting. She wondered what sign she was. Leo? Aries? Hey, what sign are you? Kiori asked. But Renee was busy standing up, so she didn't realize Kiori was talking to her. So that's the end of chapter 26. So think about the three chapters and what was happening in each one and make sure that you're paying attention to the specific details because the story and the plot is thickening each page by page.